Good morning, welcome to St Jude's for a service of morning prayer for Sunday the 18th of October. We're using a New Zealand prayer book from page 35. If you have our newsletter with you, we can follow along on that. The sentence of the day. Through the abundance of your steadfast love, I will proclaim into your house, I will come into your house and bow low in reverence toward your holy temple. Great is the Lord and worthy of all praise. Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honour, power and might be to our God for ever and ever. Amen. <coughs> Great and wonderful are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O Sovereign of the nations. Who shall not revere and praise your name, O Lord, for you alone are holy. All nations shall come and worship in your presence, for your just dealings have been revealed. To the one who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honour, glory and might, for ever and ever. Amen. Etifano Atakarati, brothers and sisters in Christ, let us praise and worship God who has called us together. Let us celebrate God's majesty and delight in the wonder of God's love. Together we shall confess our sins and receive assurance that we are forgiven. As the scriptures are read, we can allow God's word to speak to us and ponder its meaning for our lives. In our prayers, we give thanks for God's goodness. We pray for others as well as for ourselves. And we offer our lives anew in Christ's service. This we do because we believe in the presence among us of our Saviour, Jesus Christ, and in the mighty power of the Holy Spirit. Hear these words of Scripture. If we claim to be sinless, we are self-deceived and strangers to the truth. If we confess our sins, God is just and may be trusted to forgive our sins and cleanse us from every kind of wrong. Spirit of God, search our hearts. Let us, in silence, remember our need for God's forgiveness. God of mercy, we have sinned against you and against others. We have sinned in what we have done and in what we have failed to do. We are truly sorry. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for our sins, forgive us all that is past and raise us to newness of life. Amen. May Almighty God, who pardons all, to truly repent. Forgive your sins, strengthen you by the Holy Spirit, and keep you in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let, let us rejoice in the rock of our salvation. We sing to you, O God, and bless your name, and tell of your salvation from day to day. We proclaim your glory to the nations, your praise to the the ends of the earth. Much have they afflicted me from the time of my youth. May Israel now say, Much have they afflicted me from my youth, but they have not prevailed against me. They scored my back as with a ploughshare, making long their furrows upon it. But the Lord is righteous and has cut me free from the yoke of the wicked. Let them be put to confusion and driven back, or those who are enemies of Zion. Let them be like grass on the roof, which withers before it is fully grown, which never fills a reaper's hand, nor yields a sheaf for the harvester, so that passers-by will never say to them, The blessing of the Lord be upon you. We bless you in the name of the Lord. Out of the depths that I call to you, O Lord, give heed, O Lord, to my cry. Let your ears consider well the plea I make for mercy. If you should keep account of what is done amiss, who then, O Lord, could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, therefore you shall be revered. I wait for you, Lord, with all my soul, 
and in your word is my hope. My soul waits for you, O Lord, more than those who watch by night and long for the morning. More, I say, than those who watch by night and long for the morning. Wait, O Israel, for the Lord, for with the Lord there is love unfailing, and with the Lord there is ample redemption. The Lord will redeem Israel from all their sins. Our Old Testament reading this morning is from Isaiah. The Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher, that I may know how to sustain the weary with a word. Morning by morning he wakens, wakens my ear to listen as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I did not turn backwards. I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. The Lord God helps me, therefore I have not been disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who are my adversaries? Let us confront them. Let them confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me, who will declare me guilty. All of them will wear out like a garment. The moth will eat them up. Who among you fears the Lord and obeys the voice of his servant? Who walks in darkness and has no light, yet trusts in the name of the Lord and relies upon his God? The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. God's mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Your faithfulness, O Lord, is great. You are all that I have, and therefore I will wait for you. You, O Lord, are good to those who wait for you, to all those who seek you. It is good to wait in patience for the salvation of the Lord. Our New Testament reading this morning is from the Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 13, beginning at the 22nd verse. Jesus went through one town and village after another, teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, will only a few be saved? He said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow door, for many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able. When once the owner of the house has got up and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, open to us, then in reply he will say to you, I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, We ate and drank with you, and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I do not know where you come from. Go away from me, all you evildoers. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrown out. The people will come from east and west, from north and south, and will eat in the kingdom of God. Indeed, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power, for you have created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. You are worthy, O Christ, for you were slain, and by your blood have ransomed us for God, ransomed us from every tribe and people and nation, and made us a royal house of priests to our God. To the one who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honour and might for ever and ever. Amen. We say together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, 
died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you. As our Saviour Christ has taught us, we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Make your ways known upon earth, O God, your saving power among all peoples. Renew your church in holiness and help us to serve you with joy. Guide the leaders of this and every nation that justice may prevail throughout the world. Let not the needy, O God, be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Make us instruments of your peace and let your glory be all over the earth. God of the possible and the impossible, we may come to you with questions and struggle with your answers. Grant us faith in believing as we await the treasure from heaven, which is your faithful promise. Through Jesus Christ, our liberator, who is alive and reigns with you, the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Holy and ever-living God, by your power we are created and by your love we are redeemed. Guide and strengthen us by your Spirit that we may give ourselves to your service and live each day in love to one another and to you through Christ our Lord. Amen. In darkness and in light, in trouble and in joy, help us, Heavenly Father, to trust your love, to serve your purpose and to praise your name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In our second lesson this morning from Luke, Luke emphasises Jesus' teaching ministry he was passing through from one city and village to another, teaching and proceeding on his way to Jerusalem. Well, of course, if you know the end of the story, the mention of Jerusalem strikes a rather ominous note because it meant rejection by the nation and the horror and victory of the cross. Somewhere in some unnamed village, some unnamed person, the crowd asked Jesus an interesting theological question. Lord, are there only a few who are being saved? Well, we don't know the motive for that person asking the question. Perhaps he saw the increasing opposition from the religious leaders and he could sense that the crowds, although superficially interested in what Jesus was, Jesus was saying, tended to side with their leaders. Or maybe he was concerned for his own salvation. But he asked this question, are there only a few who are being saved? Well, I dare say many of us have pondered that same question. And some religious traditions, some religious leaders will give a very clear answer to that question. And it certainly would make for a very interesting and probably quite long and challenging discussion. But, as usual, Jesus doesn't actually answer the question, at least not directly. Instead, rather than talking about how others could be saved and how many there might be of those, instead he directs the question, or rather his response to the question, away from abstract theological speculation or even answers, and instead towards a specific application to each person in the crowd. 
So he, rather than saying X number will be saved, or I don't know, or only God the Father knows, he says, this is what you, as in the crowd, need to do to be saved. So even though the man couched the question in a particular way, Jesus answered what he really wanted to know, which was what I need to do to be saved, rather than say X, Y number have been saved, will be saved. So the man had asked, will the saved be few? Jesus turns it round to ask, will the saved include you? After all, that may indeed be what the man was really interested in. Remember, of course, that Jesus was talking to a crowd made up mostly of observant religious Jews. They all believed, or well, nearly all of them, possibly. There could have been some outriders. They believed in the one true God. They were not agnostics, or polytheists, or atheists, or pagans. They believed in the Hebrew Scripture and lived basically in accordance with the rules in Scripture. So in giving his answer, Jesus wasn't addressing a pagan or an agnostic or atheist audience. He was talking to a crowd of what we might describe as churchgoers. He was talking to, in modern terms, fellow Christians. And he was talking to a crowd, most of whom assumed that they would go to heaven because they were good Jews. But of course, it's up to God. And what we think is adequate may not be. Salvation requires our earnest effort, our urgent attention and our careful self-examination. But at the end of the day, it's up to God. Well, it requires our earnest effort, our striving, as the word is, is used in the text, because the door is narrow. It requires our urgent attention because the door is soon to be closed, though we don't know when that happens. And it requires our careful self-examination because once the door is closed, it will be closed for good. with No second chances. Our Lord did not say, good question, let's divide up into groups and discuss this, or let's have a focus group, or perhaps take a vote on it as to what people think. Pooling the group's thoughts, the crowd's thoughts, would have only increased speculation. And Jesus wasn't interested in speculation. He was concerned about the personal salvation of the people he was talking to, to us today. So rather than opening up for discussion, he gave a command, which applied equally to his hearers and to us. And it's a simple command. Strive to enter by the narrow door. The fact that the door is narrow implies that it takes some deliberate thought and effort to go through it, like the <coughs> other reference in scripture to the, to the um, narrow gate and the path to uh, to, to damnation being broad and the path to salvation being narrow. It's not as though there are multiple doors so you can take your pick and you'll end up in heaven. All roads lead to heaven. Not so. There's only one door and that is Jesus himself. He alone is the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except by him. John Chapter 14, verse 6. The entrance is narrow and exclusive, not broad and all-inclusive. Having said that, the mercy of God is infinite. And Jesus himself, in his earthly form, did not know, and said he didn't know, details such as who was going to be saved and who was not. But he still gives us strong guidance as to what we need, need to what we need to do to improve our chances so if there isn't one great big door that's easy to stroll through without thinking about it and it's indeed a narrow door or a narrow path 
Well, what do we do about that? We could say, I believe that God is loving and that he'll accept everybody who tries to do their best. I believe that all sincere people will get through the door. Possibly the mercy of God is infinite. But Jesus does actually say the door is narrow and not everybody will get through. Remember again that he's talking to a crowd largely of observant Jews. So even if you think you're good enough, God knows you better than you know yourself. He forgives mistakes. He forgives weakness. After all, we're, we're human. But we're still expected to strive our best. He made the door narrow without checking first whether we were going to be happy with that. God is sovereign. God decides what is best for us. And his judgment as to what is best for us is far better than what our judgment is. So whether we like it or not, Jesus says that he is the only way to God. We can either enter through the narrow door, which is Christ alone, or we can invent a broad door that includes many ways to God, and thus directly contradict what Jesus is saying. It's up to us. God gives us free will. And who knows? God's mercy is infinite. So God, so Jesus is actually asking to the asking the crowd in general, not specifically that one individual who asked him the question. He's asking, are you striving to enter the narrow door? Are you making your salvation a matter of deliberate and sustained effort? Are you sure that you're entering the narrow door as defined by Jesus and not a broad door of our own choosing. Well, salvation, free gift, received simply by grace through faith and not a matter of our own efforts. However, Jesus isn't talking about salvation by works or human effort. He's talking about our attitude towards it. All those who are only mildly interested about salvation may be in danger of not achieving it. Those who view salvation as an interesting topic for discussion are missing the point. Those who say, I believe that all roads lead to God and all good people will go to heaven are engaging in human speculation. They're not submitting to Jesus' divine revelation. Not to say they're necessarily wrong. God alone knows. It's part of his plan. We're only mortal. We're humans. We make mistakes. Even the church is fallible. And church teaching for 2,000 years may not always be accurate. We have to be careful to avoid putting our own thoughts, our own ideas forward as if they're the thoughts and the ideas and the intention and the plan of God. God is open-minded and tolerant. But he's also God. God's mercy is infinite. But he's also sovereign of the universe. Jesus tells us in response to the question that many will seek to enter the gate and not be able to do so. In some cases, because they've missed the deadline. Seems an unusual thing to talk in terms of deadline, but there is one. Though Jesus himself, in his earthly form, didn't know when that would be. Many will strive to enter, but only some will succeed. Though, again, the numbers, we don't know. His listeners assumed that all was well with them because they were decent religious people. We can be in danger of falling into that same trap. We're decent religious people. Of course we'll be saved. But just like the Pharisees who subscribed to the letter of the law but didn't have anything in their hearts, so 
So we have to be careful too. Don't fall into that trap. They didn't repent of their sins. They didn't take their salvation seriously enough. If we follow the crowd, we're in danger too of not following the Saviour into eternal life. We need to ask ourselves, what to us is the narrow door? Well, it doesn't necessarily mean mortifying the flesh, giving away all your possessions and spending all your time working for those less fortunate than yourself. It's entirely a matter of context. You could be extremely rich or extremely poor. Your chances of reaching heaven are the same. It's in your heart that the difference is to be found. What you make of your fortune, for whether it be good or bad, determines salvation. What you think about yourself isn't really the point. If you say to yourself, I will not follow conventional wisdom, I'm not going to go along with group pressure. I will follow God in my own way. It's not necessarily wrong. Because you might still be on the narrow path, heading to the narrow door. And it doesn't matter if you stray off that path from time to time. Nobody is perfect. We're not judged for that. So Jesus' first point is that salvation requires our earnest effort, our striving. If we're only half-hearted, we can miss the door. We strive to be as Christ would want us to be. And unlike the Old Testament Jews who were burdened with hundreds of regulations and rules, it's all boiled down to love God love one another. And you can't go far wrong if you keep that in mind. The day is coming when the head of the house, God, will get up and shut the door. Will we be ready? Once the door is shut, that's it. Those inside are in, those outside are out. Whenever that occurs, we need to be ready. Are we? That's why it's good practice to ask ourselves, what sort of a person am I? Not what have I done today to help others necessarily, but what's been my motivation for the action or inaction of the last 12 hours, 24 hours, whatever it might be. There's one reason why Confession uh, still required in the Roman Catholic Church and still used by some in the Anglican Church. It's a good idea because it makes you think about your actions, not necessarily just your sins, because it's not necessarily healthy to focus on where you've gone wrong. It's important to focus on where you've gone right as well, perhaps more so. Where have I contributed to God's kingdom on earth? Where and in what way have I forborne from anger? Have I restrained myself from judging? Because those are equally important to take positive steps. Since the Lord is coming soon, we don't want to procrastinate about salvation. As Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 says, it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment. Judgment, we don't like that word, really, do we, most of us, because it has a certain ring of finality. But then so does salvation. So does the idea of the door, which is a narrow one, or path, which is a narrow one. Even for the youngest and healthiest, we don't know when we'll be called. 
one advantage of growing older is that you tend to focus perhaps more than you would as a young person on what's coming next. And perhaps consider what sort of a life have I led? Uh, we're all um, condemned, I suppose, to being sinful. We're all condemned to make mistakes. But we all have the chance, while we're still alive, to reflect what path have I followed? We enter heaven on God's terms and in his time, not our own. Our actions can't buy our way into heaven. But our actions indicate our attitude to God. How is nothing but truth known too late? We don't want to go on that path. Well, if the door's shut and you're on the outside, you cry out, Lord, open to us. Not good enough. Sorry, you missed the boat to mix the metaphors. Depart from me, all you evildoers. Those who are sinful and not repented of their sin. Those who are unpenitent. Those who don't love others, but only themselves. Well, it may be that you have trouble with it, loving others because you don't like them. But as I said in other sermons, there's a big difference between loving somebody and liking them. You may strongly dislike somebody, but to love them is a different matter, and the two are not inconsistent. So what's our personal relationship with God like? Do we know or have reasonable confidence that we're on the right path? Do we love others as he would want us to love them? And that includes, do we love ourselves? Because God has entrusted us with life. God has given us a body and a soul. And to love God means to love ourselves as much as it means to love others. Salvation, though, does require our earnest efforts and, in fact, our urgent attention. We don't want the door to be closed on us. God's mercy is limitless. But we can't take it for granted for ourselves. We know that God will do what is right, but it's very presumptuous of us to say, I'm good enough. God has infinite mercy and justice, so he'll let me through, despite me being lacklustre. Um, I don't really like anyone and I never really care for anyone or do good. But I don't do bad, so it must be okay. I'll get through. Sorry. With judgment comes the decision. And the decision isn't on the basis of whether you've done enough good, but rather whether in your heart you're somebody that God will say, I know that person. I know that soul. And I want them in my company in heaven? Or are they the sort of person who would be more comfortable, if that's the right word, elsewhere? Shut out from the presence of God. Self-examination is always good. Don't beat ourselves up too much. Most of us are good enough, I dare say. All of us can improve. Self-reflection is a good habit to do regularly because the door is narrow and the time is passing. We want to be ready. But if you love one another and you love God, then you're probably on the right path. Amen. We'll say the grace together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Go now to love and serve the Lord. Go in peace. Amen. We go in the name of Christ. And please join me, your parishioner, for morning tea at 11 o'clock on Zoom.